Okay, so um, my name is Asaf Naor, and I'm going to introduce a meat singer. Um, those of you who are wondering why I'm the one introducing him, um, this is the last talk of a very um, intensive day, a conference that we had, our first annual meeting of a think tank that's um, sponsored by the Science Foundation called Algorithms and Geometry, ANG, and Amit Singer is one of our principal investigators, and we had, um, we just ended, or this is going to be the last talk of um, our first annual conference, um, and it's open to the public, and I'm, um, and you're going to see a little bit of, of what we do here. Um, I want to introduce Amit. Amit is a professor of mathematics in Princeton. Um, he obtained his bachelor's degree um, in, 205, in 205 from uh, Tel Aviv University and spent three years at Yale before coming to Princeton in 208. He's an applied mathematician who um, works on, um, on various areas. Um, we're going to hear one of them, but what the hallmark of what he does is that he uses really advanced and sophisticated mathematics um, to solve um, useful problems. And, um, and he, he received various awards, and including the Simon, Simon's Investigator Award, um, the Sloan Fellowship, and the Moore Investigator just last year. And he, as I said, he's also one of the principal investigators at the Algorithms and Geometry think tank that's meeting today. And so I'll, I'll give, the, I'll give the floor to Amit, and he'll talk today about um, solving the 3D puzzle of, of rotation alignment in single particle cry uh, cryo-electron microscopy. So, thank you. I'm going to okay, thank you, Asaf, and uh, thank you for the introduction. It's been a, a really interesting uh, day of uh, talks, and I hope not to disappoint you with the last one. <laughs> so, uh, ca can you hear me clearly? No? No? Louder? So I'll just do it like <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the microphone. Is it better now? Okay. So uh, I would like to, to actually start my talk with uh, a confession that as a kid, I really like to to solve jigsaw puzzles. And nowadays, I make this more fancier uh, 3D puzzles. But as a kid, of course, I didn't try to, to solve it using mathematical formulation, which I'll try to do today. So we can think of, of solving a 3D jigsaw puzzle as minimizing this cost function. Oh, so I should use the stick. Uh, solving this cost function that you see here, where n is the number of uh, of pieces that you have in the puzzle. And for every piece of the puzzle, you need to find where to place it on, on, on the globe. That is, you need to find a location on the unit sphere. And also, you need to find the in-plane rotation. And so basically, for every piece of the puzzle, we need to figure out an element of the rotation group, SO3. So you can think of it as rotating the sphere so that the piece of the puzzle stays in the North Pole and has the right in-plane rotation. And between any two pieces of the puzzle, there is some interaction, Fij. So this is the cost function which say, tells you that the two pieces of the puzzle cannot overlap. So for example, there is a repulsion that will take you, say, to minus infinity or some very large number if they, if they overlap. You, de you don't care if they are far apart. So then say that this function Fij is 0 if they are far apart. And if they just touch each other, well, now you need to find exactly the configuration. You have some some cost that, that is related to it. And what we are trying to do is you, you have this kind of cost for any pair of, uh, of, of, of puzzle pieces, and you are, you'd like to minimize a global cost function. Now, the issue that if, if we try to solve it, say, on a computer, then we are facing with the issue that the parameter space is very, very large. So if we have n pieces, then the parameter space is, is our group, SO3, raised to, the, raised to the n. So even if you discretize, say, SO3, with some, say, reasonably even small number, like 100 or 1,000, then the search space is now 1,000 to the n. And so how do we solve this, this, this kind of optimization problems in, in a computational tractable way? Now, OK, uh, so nowadays I'm not only interested in puzzles, but, but also in, in, in other problems coming from uh, signal image processing and, and 
the main focus of the talk will be an application in structural biology. And so I would like to start with an application in, in, a, in a signal processing, actually an application that, came so, that comes from, uh, from radar. And so the, in this application, we are, we are facing with, with, with multiple signals. So for example, on top you see two step functions, basically the two blue, the two blue signals. And all of us can see that there is some relative shift between the, the two signals, and it's very easy to find it. So for example, the one on the left can be a signal that, that, the, that the radar transmit, and the one on the right can be the one that, that, that we receive, and we'd, we'd be interested in finding the, the time delay. And by simple cross-correlation, we can find the delay even with our, with our eyes. In, in applications, what we receive is, is typically not a clean signal anymore, but, but actually noisy. And so this is the green signal that you see on the right. But, but still, even with our eyes, we can do the correlation and find the, the correct uh, time delay. And, but now think of a, sit a situation that, that you are not the transmitter of the signal, but, but actually you are some eavesdropper that can actually receive multiple, uh, multiple signals. And so you don't know the, cl the, the blue one. You only see green ones. Well, if the signal-to-noise ratio is still not too bad, then still you can do correlation and find the relative shift. But if you're in an environment where the noise is very, very high, the SNR, the signal-to-noise ratio, to noise ratio is, is low, then it becomes almost impossible to, to do just pairwise matching and, find the, and, and to find the relative shift. But still there is hope if there are more than just two signals, if there are many of them. And that's why we call this problem multi-reference alignment, because our multi-references that we want to align. And actually, for, in this problem, there is actually a way to, to recover the underlying, the underlying signal uh, using method of, of invariance that, that I will not discuss today, because there are other problems where there are no invariants, like, like the power spectrum, or uh, I mean invariants that, that, that do not change if you shift the signal. And, but what we'd like, we'd like to try to do is, is, is somehow, just like we did for the puzzle, can we exhaustively search the entire space of, of, of parameters, that is to find the shift for every signal, and find the configuration for which we maximize the likelihood, say, if we have some, some no model for, for the noise, say, Gaussian noise, and to do it in a computationally tractable way. So what I would like to show you in, in, in this slide is actually this problem of multi-reference alignment is just an instance of the same optimization problem that we saw in the previous uh, uh, slide. And we can actually treat it in, in, a, in a more general uh, group setting and, and group actions. And so, so we can think of, of, of shifting the signal. So suppose it's a signal on the unit circle and and so let's say x be a vector space of, of signals of the unit circle, let's say band-limited signals. So these are signals that just have, do not have a very high frequency content. And the group of transformation is simply shift, that is SO2, just rotating the unit circle. And this group of transformations, it acts on x by simply taking an element of x and say if we want to rotate it by angle alpha, then all we do is just look at x at say theta minus alpha, just rotating, just rotating the signal. And the model that we have for our measurements is of the following form, that is our measurement yi is simply rotating the signal x that we would like to estimate by the unknown group element gi, and then maybe sampling it at some finite number of discretized points, and then we also add additive noise to the, to the measurement. And so P is just a linear operator from, from X to the measurement space, Y. And our goal is to estimate X from, and, and the group elements, the GIs, from measurements Y1 to, y, to Yn. Now we can formulate it in terms of, in the maximum likelihood estimator framework, that is, we'd like when we unrotate signal number i by the correct group element gi, and we unrotate signal number j by the correct group element gj, then 
the signal part x should be exactly the same, and it should cancel out. And all we are remain with is, is just the noise. And so if it's a white Gaussian noise, then this would be the, log, the negative log likelihood function. And so, uh, and so we'd like to, to minimize that over by searching over all group elements. And again, you see that it's just another instance of the general frame of optimization framework that, that we saw initially. Now, for, for the more, uh, say, theoretical computer science inclined audience, so uh, you also realize that, that such problems also appear uh, quite often in, 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 uh, in, in, in computer science when you take finite groups. So when G, for example, is, is, is the group uh, Z2, just the group containing two elements, plus one and minus one, then this optimization problem can actually encode some very famous uh, uh, problem in, in theoretical computer science, such that Max Cad, Little Grotendieck, and the stochastic block model uh, clustering. I'll not go into that because this is a more uh, public uh, lecture. But, uh, but we also see that, for example, if there is a problem called uh, a constraint satisfaction problem called max 2 lean over the group uh, ZL, just the integers modulo L, where you try to find variables, say, from, from 0 to L minus 1 x size, from knowing their, their differences modulo L. So you want to find x i from knowing x i minus x j equals b i j. And you want to find a solution that satisfies as many such constraints as possible. And it is well known that this is one of the formulations of, of a problem called unique games. Uh, and, and there is a, a famous conjecture related to, to unique games which tells us also something about the hardness of, uh, of solving optimization problems of, of, of this kind. And you see that in the case of, of this uh, max, to, max to lean, we can again formulate it as optimization problem using this cost function, fij, where we just give the cost minus one if we're able to satisfy the equation, and zero if, if, if we cannot satisfy the equation. Now, the main difference between what we are going to talk about today and, and, and this kind of problem that in, in the, the problem that I'm interested in most are non-unique. I mean, the games are non-unique in general. That is, there is not just one. I mean, if they're called unique games because if, if you know, say, the value of xi, then bij uniquely determines xj. But, but for, the, for the problem that, that, that we're interested in, there may be multiple different uh, solutions, and each one gets a different, uh, a different cost or a different objective. And also, the groups are not necessarily finite. So we already saw, for example, the case of SO2 that has infinite number of, of elements. OK, so now we actually go to the, to the application that I care about most, which is the problem of, uh, of uh, single particle reconstruction using CRAR-EM. So single particle reconstruction in, in CRAR-EM is a, is a method to finding three-dimensional structures of uh, biological macromolecules. And this is a technique that, that nowadays can, uh, can get to actually quite high, high resolution that, that is starting to compete with uh, the more classical methods of, uh, of X-ray crystallography and, and, and NMR spectroscopy. And what they do in, in, in CRAR-EM, so this is used for molecules that cannot be crystallized. So instead of crystallizing the molecules, what they do, they just freeze the molecules in a very thin layer of ice. And so the ice layer is so thin that at the moment of, of freezing, every molecule just picks some random orientation and some random position inside the ice layer. And it is so thin that if you look at it in the vertical direction, you'd see at most one molecule. But there is just no room for two molecules to be one on top of the other. And then they they shoot an electron beam at the ice layer, at the specimen. The electron beam goes through the ice, through the molecule, if there is a molecule there. And beneath you have, you have a film or a, or, or a camera. And what you measure are projection, noisy projection images, 2D projection images of the 3D molecules. 
the model is, is that just like the same model in, in uh, computerized tomography, the intensity of every pixel in the camera is proportional to the, to the path integral of the electric potential created by the molecule. So the molecule is made of, of say, charge, uh, of charge uh, atoms, so you have this electron density and so on. And uh, what you measure is the path integral of that, el of that electron uh, density. And the problem then, given such 2D projection images, say the first thing that you do, you do particle selection. You need to find out where the particles are in the, in the micrograph. From such noisy 2D projection images, then you need to figure out what is the 3D structure of the molecule. Now, what I show you here on top is just an artist's concept. These are not real molecules, and this is not a true projection image. This is just what I generated on my computer. So, uh, and the, so, so the level of noise that you will see very soon in, in, in real micrograph is, is, is much higher. And the reason why there is so much noise in the images is because the, the imaging process itself is destructive. So what I mean by that, as the electron beam goes through the molecule, it breaks down the chemical bonds that actually make the molecule. So the, the electron beam has so much energy that it breaks down the electron, the, the chemical bonds that, that, that make the, the, the molecule. And for that reason, you want to use as low a dose as possible. That is, uh, because otherwise you are just not imaging the, ri the right thing. It's no longer the same molecule. You destroy the high frequency content as, as, as as you bombard with more and more uh, electrons. And so this is also the reason why, why they call it single particle reconstruction, because we have only one image per particle. So in other methods, for example, if you are not interested in high resolution, what you can do, you can take a set of images, say a micrograph, then tilt the specimen, and take another set of, of images, and then tilt again, and get a tomographic series, and then use similar method to what they do in, in medical imaging to find a density map of, of the molecule. But here, because we want to really get to high resolution so that later on biologists can actually figure out the locations of the atoms in, in, in the molecule, we are only allowed to take one image per particle, hence the name single particle reconstruction. So now it's actually very interesting times for, uh, for CryoEM in the sense that, that the method can really achieve high resolution. And this is due to advances in, in, in detector technology. So actually only last week, last Friday, there was a, a paper in, in, in Science Express where uh, they showed reconstruction using cryo to 2.2 angstrom resolution, uh, a lab at, at the NIH. Now I'll not go into this, uh, in this technology, but, but there is now a lot of improvements in, in, in that field. And that's what I'm saying that it's, it's it's getting to the point where it really rivals the, the other methods of, of crystallography, expert crystallography in, in an MR. What I would like to focus on is, is, is the mathematical problem of, of, of CryoEM. How do we actually do the reconstruction? So, uh, so first I need to tell you what is the, the forward model, the image formation model. So, so we have the 3D molecule, phi, that we don't know what it is. So, so here is just a cartoon image of, of a possible molecule. And so phi is, just think of it as a function from, 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 from the three space variables, x, y, z. And it gives you the electric potential at, that, at, at any location in R3. And the way that you obtain the image is that you first rotate phi by the unknown rotation in SO3. And after the rotation, then you integrate it in, say, in the z direction. So after you're integrating the z direction, what you are left with is just an image, which is a function of x, y. So x and y would be, say, the coordinates of in the image plane. So this is the image formation model. But of course, we also have noise, as, as I described uh, earlier. And so the inverse problem of cryoEM, now that I told you the forward model, is to estimate phi given a set of noisy images I1 to IN. Now, obviously, if, if someone tells us the, the unknown rotations, R1 to RN, then we've reduced the problem to, to a classical problem in, in computerized tomography, just the medical imaging problem. 
say, a patient that needs to do a CT scan. Okay, so the patient would go into the, into the machine, is he or she are being told not to move for the duration of the imaging process, so that the machine exactly knows the directions in which it looks at the patient. But here is the molecules, we cannot give them, we cannot give the molecules instructions, and so we look at the molecules at, at, at random and unknown rotations. And so somehow we also need to estimate those rotations, and once they are known, then we can move on and estimate phi. So here is just an illustration. So suppose that I'm giving you 12 projection images that are shown here. The goal is to estimate the 3D structure. So here, perhaps, that you've seen enough, say, Disney movies, and uh, based on some of the images that you see here, you can make some educational guesses of, 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 of what the 3D structure looks like. But with the experimental images, the task is much more complicated. So what I show you here is, is a sample of, of four images out of a much, la out of a much larger uh, data set containing 27,000 particle images that were provided to us by my collaborator, uh, Fred Sigwas from Yale Medical School. And at first, probably this just looks like noise, but, but, but if you stare at it for enough time, then, then you, you, you start seeing some structure that around the center of the images, the pixels are somewhat brighter, and this is actually a guidance for how to do particle picking. And now I'd like to convince you that, that actually there is a signal there by showing you a movie, which, which shows which show the 3D reconstruction that we did from, from these projection images. So what, what you see in the movie are two structures, one in, one in yellow, one in white. The, the white one is our reconstruction from the 27 thousand particle images, and, and the yellow one is the ground truth. The reason why here we have ground truth is because it's a subunit of a molecule called the ribosome, for which actually the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded in, in 2009. So we actually know the structure to much higher resolution for, than what you see here. So, uh, so the resolution that, that you see here is not, is not uh, the resolution of, of X-ray, of course. And this was actually something that we, we've done a few years ago. But it just shows that actually we can estimate rotations and we can estimate the structure, but now I need to tell you how, how it's being done. So for those who are interested in, in, in actually working with, with such data set and, and, and doing construction, I, I will tell you that, that the methods that, that, that uh, we're developing are, are actually available to public usage, they're freely available. in. in in a, a software toolbox called Aspire, algorithm for signal particle reconstruction that you can get from, from this website at, at Princeton. So, so to solve an, an, the cry and problem and to get 3D reconstruction, you usually have to, there are actually many computational challenges. Well, one of them is the retention assignment, the first one, that will be the focus of, of the talk today. But there are actually other computational aspects and, and challenges that I will not discuss today, like how to find the particles, what to do when, when, the, when the structures of the molecules are not exactly the same. This is called the heterogeneity problem, and you actually like to find also the variations of, in, in structures between the different molecules. How to denoise the images, how to decide what is the symmetry of the molecule, the point of group symmetry, if there is symmetry. So there, there are actually many interesting computational challenges. Today I will just focus on, on what I believe to be the main fundamental problem in Crowley, which is the orientation assignment problem. So the way that most, uh, say, structural biology labs who are doing CRAR-EM solve the retention estimation problem is the following uh, method, which is, which is called iterative refinement. So, so the, the way they approach the problem is, is by saying the following. Let's guess some structure. So suppose that we have some good guess for what the structure should be like. Let's say we have some really good dream last night, and, 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 and we envision how the, the molecule should look like. So we have a, an initial estimate. Given that estimate, now you can simply project it in different directions and produce 2D projection images of, of, that, uh, of that structure. Let's call, them, let's call them 2D template images. And now for each of the noisy experimental images, you can find their best match among the templates. So once you find that best match, basically, because you know the rotations that correspond to the templates, basically in this way you can assign 
rotations to the, to the noisy experimental images. Once you have assigned rotation, then you can now just use classical computerized tomography and reconstruct the 3D structure of, of the molecule. So now you have a new estimate for the structure. Once you have a new estimate for the structure, say phi, what you do, you just repeat the process iteratively until conver convergence. So it's called alternating minimization, and you can also put it in the framework of expectation maximization. The issue is that you do not have any guarantee that you actually converge to the, to the global solution, that is to the, to the global uh, optimum of, of, of the likelihood function. All your guarantee is to find some local uh, optimum. And also it is very well known that, that this process is very much affected by the initial guess. And this is known as, as model bias. So, uh, so if, 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 if I have one guess for the molecule and, and, and say Asaf comes up with, with a different guess, we may converge to completely different molecules. And so the question is, does there exist some procedure, a completely reference-free or intention assignment uh, algorithm that, is, that only looks at the data without imposing any prior assumption of, of ours that will find the 3D structure for us and estimate the rotations. And so for today's talk, I'm, I'm going to assume that the molecule has no non-trivial point group symmetry, and also that all the 3D structures look the same, that is homogeneity, although extensions are, are, are actually not that difficult to, to the more generalized case. OK, so we need some basic uh, theorem from, from uh, the field of computerized tomography, which is called the Fourier projection slice theorem. And what the slice theorem says, it gives us a way to relate the 3D Fourier transform of the 3D molecule and the 2D Fourier transform of the 2D projection images. What the slice theorem says that if you take a projection image, say image number i, and now consider its two-dimensional Fourier transform, then the values of the two-dimensional Fourier transform of the image are nothing but the restriction of the 3D Fourier transform of the molecule to a planar slice that goes through the origin and whose orientation or direction is completely perpendicular to the viewing direction. And so, for example, in medical imaging, once if you know the viewing directions, then basically by taking the 2D Fourier transform of each of your projection images, you can populate this, the 3D reciprocal space, the, the 3D Fourier space, with planes. And if you have enough samples, if, if you sampled uh, densely enough, then you can just take the 3D inverse Fourier transform and get the density map in, in, in real space. Now, the issue in, in, in cryo-EM, in signal particle cryo-EM, that we don't know the rotations. So we know that we have slices going through the, or through the origin, but just like the 3D puzzles are completely unorganized. We need somehow to bring structure to, to the world. And so luckily there is some basic geometry that we can employ here. And so that's something that we learn in, in, in elementary school or, or, or maybe some of us in high school, that if you take two planes in R3, unless they are parallel to each other, they are going to intersect at a line. So this means that if you take the 2D projection images and look at them in the Fourier transform, so let's say I'm looking at I, I hat and I j hat, then I'm bound to find a pair of lines, one line in, say, the Fourier transform of image I, say the red line, and the red line in image A, on which the values of the Fourier transform completely agree. Why? Because they just correspond to a single line in the, in the 3D Fourier transform. That's the common line of intersection. So from this we know that, OK, with clean images, we should be able to find that common line by just doing, say, brute force search over all, per, over all lines in image I with all lines in image A and find say, the best match. And this tells us where the two planes intersect. But we're actually still missing one degree of freedom, which is the angle between the two planes. So SO3, the group of rotations, 
is parameterized by three parameters, say the three Euler angles, or a point on the sphere, the viewing direction, and in-plane rotation. So two out of the three parameters are determined by the common line, but we're still missing this one degree of freedom of the angle between the two planes. And so in the 80s, it was proposed to, to estimate that, that angle by simply adding a third plane. So this was discovered more or less independently in the east and the west. And the, the algorithm was named angular reconstitution. So the idea that by knowing the, the three pairs of common lines between three images, then the relative rotations between the three images are completely determined, well, maybe up to reflection. So, so actually the handedness or chirality of, of the molecule cannot be decided by just looking at, at, at common lines. Now, we can ask ourselves, is, is angular constitution is, a, is, is, is also a valid way of, of actually solving the, the rotation assignment problem in, in practice? So for clean images, it looks like a very neat way to get the rotations, but, but does it also work with noisy images? So let's do a very simple uh, simulation where we start with, say, a clean projection image and just add Gaussian white noise to it at different level of, of signal to noise ratio. So maybe at, at 2 to the minus 6 or 2 to the minus 7, this resembles what we saw earlier with, with the experimental images. And at such noise level, I mean, we did the simulation, so we have lots of images, and I know the, the, the rotations. So we can check if we detect the common lines accurately or not. And so this is the detection rate of the common line. That's the fraction of, time, of the number of times that we actually detected the common line correctly. And we see that at 2 to the minus 6 or 2 to the minus 7, the detection rate is, say, about 10%. So 1 in 10 times we actually find the common line correctly which means that you need to be extremely lucky for the three pairs of images to, find, to detect the common lines correctly. All right, so it's one over, one over 10 raised to the power of three. And even, you, you're, and even if, you're, if you are so lucky, then the fourth image or the fifth image and so on, when you build your way sequentially, at some point you'll make mistake. And there are also discretization errors that will accumulate and so on. So, we would, we would like to come up with an algorithm that, that takes all images and look at all the common lines between them at once and somehow found the set of rotations that give us a solution that is as consistent as possible with, with the common lines. Now, one way to do it, or, or maybe the first approach to do it, like being an applied mathematician, is, is to try a least squares approach. What is the least squares approach? The least squares approach says the following. So we know that, so let's just add a little bit of notation. So let's say that xij, yij is a point on the unit circle in, in the coordinate system of image number i that tells us where image j intersects with image i. And now let's append it with, with zero. So cij is simply a unit vector in R3, but it sits on the xy plane. So we know that if we rotate cij by ri, then it will take this planar vector and it will rotate it to its correct location in R3. And similarly, if we rotate CJI by RJ, then it will rotate it to its correct location in R3. But those two locations are actually exactly the same because it's the common line. So we can write this linear equation, RICIJ equals RJ CJI. And so, it seems that now we're in a very favorable situation in which there are only n variables that we need to recover, n rotations, and we have an order of n squared equation that we can write. Because for every pair of images, for every i and j, we can write such, a rot such, such an equation. And so the least squares approach would be to try to minimize this just quadratic cost function that looks at, at the square distance between RICIJ and RJCJI. But the issue is that the minimization needs to take place over a set which is not very easy to minimize over. That is, the set is SO3 raised to the n, and the issue is that SO3 is not convex. 
that is, the set of rotations is not convex. If, if you take the average of, of two rotations, typically it's not a rotation anymore. And so the question is how to search this exponentially without a, a, a non-convex uh, search space. And previously, we, we've proposed some algorithms that are based on, on spectral and semi-definite program relaxations. And for those of you, again, from, from the TCS community, you may recognize that this looks somewhat similar to, to problems like the, non, the non-commutative uh, Grotendieck uh, inequality and, 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 and Max Cut. So, so, so you can get a, a, a hint at least of where uh, the algorithms uh, come from. But I don't want to actually discuss too much uh, this approach because also this approach is suboptimal. And the reason why it's suboptimal is just what we saw before with the multi-reference alignment problem. That pairwise alignment, pairwise comparison, when you're, you, when you're looking at very noisy signals, can horribly fail. And, and so, so basically, when you're comparing two noisy CRAR-EM images, and you're trying to find the common line between them, typically you're going to get completely garbage. I mean, the estimation of the common line is going to be completely, completely wrong. But so, and if, if the algorithm only sees the common line direction, the CIJs and CJIs, but it is not allowed to go back to the images and actually use all the, the pixel values, then you're basically, you're, you're basically not allowing it to, to, to actually look at, at, at the entire set of information. So for example, maybe the second best common line is the one that should be used. Or maybe if, if, if you come up with a set of rotations that, that, that you think are the best rotation, but then you look back at the images and the implied common lines are completely off. I mean, you, you see that the, the values of, 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 of on these lines are completely different. You can say, okay, this cannot be the common line. Right? This cannot be the, really the rotation. But, but the algorithm doesn't know about it because he, he, he only allowed it to, to look at, at those CIJ. So somehow you compress some geometric information from the images and now the algorithm is not allowed to look at any more the images. So clearly this is a suboptimal approach that would work only at, at relatively high SNR, even that we are actually comparing all pairs of images. So in some sense, okay, we're still doing better than angular reconstitution, but we are trying to fight, say, an exponential disease, which is the detection rate of common lines, with only a, poly a polynomial cure, which is, okay, we're using n squared of comparing all pairs of images. But what we really want to do is something which is maybe more ambitious, that is, we'd really like, just like we, we formulate the multi-reference sample, we'd really like to, f to find the maximum likelihood estimator, that is, We'd like to somehow search the entire space of parameters, SO3 to the N, all possible rotations. For every such configuration, we'd like to, say, compute the common lines implied by those rotations, go back at the images, and give a score. Okay? So this is what we really want to do, but it sounds like out of reach, right? So it sounds like computationally intractable. So not only that the search space is exponentially large, but also we are going to end up dealing with a cost function that is very complicated. So before like, the cost function was quadratic, now it's going to be some very non-smooth, non-linear function that by just, I mean, because you're going to move the directions of the lines a little bit, the cost is going to change in, in a very non-linear fashion. But, but now I'm going to show that it's actually possible to do it. So first, I'm just going to show that, again, this can be formulated as the same canonical optimization problem that we saw before, namely a problem of, of this kind. So the way that we're going to, the way to see it, well, it's actually not so difficult to convince yourself, yourself that the CIJs and CJIs, they are the directions of these common lines, they're only a function of the relative ratio between the rotations. So I'm going to skip this, this uh, exercise in, in geometry in finding the directions. 
but w once, once you convince yourself that's the case, then the maximum likelihood estimator is simply the solution to this minimization problem. So again, you're going to compare now the Fourier transform of image i or in Fourier transform of image j when you restrict them to those lines. So say this is just the, the radial coordinate, say the radius, and this is just the direction. And so you're looking at the L2, the squared L2 distances between the lines, where Cij and Cji are a function of the relative ratio between Ri and Rj. And so this again falls into our optimization framework where G is SO3. And Fij's, for every pair of images, you need to compare this, this cost function. OK, so, so now, after discussing the applications and how to formulate all of, all of them in, in, in this uh, general optimization framework, now we're going to discuss actually how to solve it, OK? So, so th the first idea is, uh, is that we're going to somehow linearize the cost function. And so although it's, it's a nonlinear optimization problem, we're going to linearize it using the Fourier transform over the group. So, so perhaps we're, we're all familiar with, with the Fourier transform over uh, SO2, over the circle. So just to remind ourselves, so if we have a function, say, f of alpha, so alpha is just the angle, takes values from 0 to 2 pi, we can expand it in a Fourier series where the f at k's are the Fourier coefficients. And these are the trigonometric polynomials, e to the i k alpha. And the Fourier coefficients, well, we have a formula for them. They're just the integral of the function over the circle, but we need to weigh them by e to the minus i k alpha. And so for every k, we get a Fourier coefficient. And the amazing thing is that, well, you can then do synthesis and, and from the Fourier coefficients get back the function. So, so this is for over SO2, but actually there are there is a similar Fourier transform over a compact groups in, in, in general that where the formulation is very similar but goes through the irreducible representations of, of, of the group. So in, in more generality, so G is an element of the group capital G. And so we have a function over the group G. And this function we can again expand in a Fourier series. Now, now the Fourier coefficients, f at k, they are no longer scalars, but actually they are matrices of size dk by dk, where dk is the dimension of the representation. And rho k, well, this is a matrix function of, over the group. So you can think of rho k g as just uh, the generalization of what we saw before for e to the i k alpha. So alpha was the group element, like g here. And it's the same k as, as, as we saw before. So this, and the trace, OK, looks at the matrix and just found the diagonal elements. Now, the Fourier coefficients, so now the coefficients are matrices of size dk by dk. And they are given again by integration over the group. So you integrate the function, and now against, say, the complex conjugate transpose of, of, of the representation. So, so the raw case are unitary matrices. It's a unitary irreducible representation of the group. So for example, for SO2, the dimensions are 1. But for SO3, then the dimensions are actually the odd numbers 1, 3, 5, uh, 7, and so on. So another way for you to think about it is on those representations. So for those who are familiar with, with Wigner D matrices, then the raw case are the Wigner D matrices. But Another way to think about it is k, think of this k as, as, as dimension of homogeneous polynomials over the sphere. So for example, for k equals to 1 and we're on the unit, say on the unit sphere in R3, the homogeneous polynomials are x, y, and z. And if you rotate, say you take, you take any of them, say x, but now you rotate the sphere, it will no longer be x. It will be some linear combination of x, y, and z now. So this change of basis transformation can be represented by an orthogonal matrix. And this would be row 1 in that case. What would be row 2? So now you can look at homogeneous polynomials of degree 2. 
say x squared, y squared, we no longer need z squared because on the sphere the sum is, 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 is constrained to be one. So x squared, y squared, xz, yz, and, uh, and, and xy. So we have now five of them instead of all six. So that's wh why the dimension is, is five, okay? Two times two plus one. And again, you have a change of basis transformation. Okay, so now you'll have a five by five orthogonal matrix and so on. So these are the representations. And DG is simply the how measure, just the uniform measure over the group. So that's the general formula. Okay, so now how do we do the, the linearization? Okay, so, so we know that I can take any function, any squared integrable function over the group, and I can expand it in a Fourier series. So now I'm going to introduce variables. So for every k and every ij, we want to find, of course, the gi, gj. We don't know them. So, so these, these were the original variables. But now I'm going to introduce some auxiliary variables, x, i, j, k, that should be those matrices of size dk by dk. So I'm introducing these matrix variables. And using these matrix variables, we can rewrite the global cost function as a linear function of the auxiliary variables, the x, i, j, k. So we just substitute for rho k of g i, g j inverse, we just substitute here. So now the idea is that we started from some very complicated nonlinear function. But you see that now I can actually view it as a linear function of the variables x, i, j, k. Again, I remind you that it's, these coefficients are known. These are just the Fourier coefficients of f, i, j. Now, this, this, these variables that we introduce, they, we should somehow constrain them. I mean, if we don't constrain them, then the trivial solution for, for, for the optimization problem. So I just set all of them to be zero, okay? So if, if your cost function is non-negative, you can just set all of them to be zero and, and you solve the optimization problem. So somehow we need to, to, to add constraints. Okay, so, so I claim that it's, it's it's not going to be very difficult to see that the x case should satisfy the three constraints that we see here. And so let me convince you that that's the case. So I remind you that it's the x i j k. Okay, so because it's a representation, it's a homomorphism, so we can write this rho k of g i times rho k of g j inverse. So basically it factorizes in this way. And this suggests that we can write it every matrix x k, well think of it as a matrix of size n by n whose elements are, are, are by themselves matrices, we can factorize it in, in this way, which, which suggests that the matrix must be positive semi-definite. So that's constraint number one. Constraint number two, if you take i equals to j, then, well, we see from here that, well, it's the representation of the identity element, and so the representation of the identity element must be the identity matrix. So on the diagonal, we have identity matrices of size dk by dk. And also the rank of the matrix must be dk. Again, from this representation. Now, the rank constraint is, is non-convex. And because we would like to use some kind of efficient way to solve the problem, so using convex programming, then we're going to drop it. But if we're going to, to drop it, then nothing anymore Again, this allows us to choose the xi jk as being zero away from the diagonal. So, but even if we keep the, the rank constraints, then nothing really couples different, different representations of different orders. So for example, xk and xk prime, let's say, different k's, they are not related in any way our constraints are just given individually for each case separately. And so we really want those representations to correspond to the same group element. So somehow something that relates the different, different group elements. Otherwise we can just, we'll get some very weird solutions. So, so now I'd like to show you a way to actually relate and couple all these representations together. 
So originally, this, 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 this coupling is, is, is very nonlinear. So uh, if, if, if you think about it, just think of, say, SO2, we have a representation. The representations are e to the i k alpha. So the first representation would be, say, e to the i alpha, and the second one would be e to the i 2 alpha. So obviously, there, there is a connection between them that one is just the square of the other. But saying that one is the square of the other is a very nonlinear constraint that I will not be able to, to encode in, in, in an efficient computational manner. So instead, we are trying, we, we're going to look for some linear constraints. So we try now to, to relate those, those representations. And let's, so let's try from, start from SO2. And so for over SO2, we know that if we sum all of them, say k for minus infinity to infinity, then summing all of them together gives us a delta function over the, over the circle. So OK, so, so, so we know that if we're, if, if we're going to sum all of them together, we should get a delta function. Now, but really, I want to relate it to, say, the ratio, say, between gi and gj, so correspond to it angles alpha and alpha j. So if I'm now shifting the delta function by alpha i minus alpha j, then, OK, we're shifting the alpha, so I'm writing it here. And we can write this term in terms of the auxiliary variables, the x, i, j, k. So you see that that this weighted sum of, of our variables must be the delta function. So now how to, how to encode it? Well, I mean, how to tell the computer that this is a delta function? Well, I cannot really tell that, that it's a delta function, but we can relax it. What do I mean by that? We know that the delta function is everywhere non-negative, right? It's, it's 0 everywhere except for a single point where it's like, say, plus infinity. So, but we can write that it. it's everywhere non-negative. So for every alpha, it's, it's, it's non-negative. And also, it needs to integrate to 1. So the integration to 1 is simply the constraint that the zero-order representation is a trivial one, just xij0 equals to 1. And we have, in addition, the non-negativity constraints. But still, we are facing an issue because I still cannot tell the computer that the infinite sum, okay, I cannot introduce infinite number of, of, of variables, and also I cannot impose an infinite number of points. So we need to do some further relaxation. Okay, so so this is so now we're going to to solve this issue using some very classical harmonic analysis, a Fourier analysis. And we remind ourselves that if we are trying to do the very simplest truncation, that is, instead of going from minus infinity to plus infinity, say we're just going to sum from some minus m to plus m, or m is, 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 an is, is a positive integer, then this is known as the Dirichlet kernel. And the Dirichlet kernel, well, it oscillates. And it oscillates in such a way that it has it, it assumes both positive and negative values. And those oscillations are really the source for what is known as the Gibbs phenomena. So for those of you who, who did some uh, signal processing and, 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 and try to approximate functions using a Fourier series, you, you know that there are overshoots and, and, and undershoots. And, uh, and, and you also know that even if you start with a continuous function, the Fourier series does not con converge uniformly to the function. So, but then in the early 20th century, Fayer came up with, with, with a remedy. And the, re the remedy was to take the Dirichlet kernel and to look at what it's called its first order Cesaro mean. That is, you simply average the, the Dirichlet kernel. And equivalently, it's, it's Instead of summing e to the ik alpha, you filter them by, by a weight function that, that is one for at, at the low frequency, but then it, it drops linearly as you go to the higher frequencies. And it turns out that the Fayer kernel is non-negative. So unlike the Dirichlet kernel that takes both positive and negative values, the, the Fayer kernel is, is, is positive over the unit circle. 
And in fact, if you write your function and expand it in terms of Fourier and also multiply by, by those weights, then you can actually get, and, and your function was continuous, actually you get uniform convergence, okay? which is in some sense an, an alternative proof for, to the Weierstrass theorem. So see that every continuous function you can approximate using uh, polynomials, and it will converge uniformly. So, so that's good news, because now we can replace our constraint by a finite constraint, saying that, that this weighted sum of our variables must be non-negative. Well, but now we still have to do it for every alpha. OK, but at least we're able to replace the infinite sum over over the representation with the finite sum. But still now we have to, to deal with the issue that we have to impose it at an infinite number of points. So one way to, to deal with it is to say, okay, we'll just impose it at a finite number of points over the circle. This would be a relaxation, a perfectly fine one. But actually, again, we can use a theorem related with, uh, associated with, with Feyer. It's called the, the feyer ritz uh, factorization theorem that says that if P is a non-negative trigonometric polynomial over the unit circle, then that is P to, of e to the i alpha is non-negative for every alpha, then it must be the case that P is simply the absolute value squared of some other polynomial. All, again, for, for, for the most signal processing minded people, all it says that P must be the power spectrum of, of, of some signal. That, that comes from an autocorrelation function. Now, the fact that P must have this form, actually you can encode it using semi-definite constraints. Now, for every i and j, you, you look at all the matrices associated with the different representations, and there would be a semi-definite constraint that relates them. So actually, this means that we have n squared semi -def positive semi-definite constraints on matrices of size, say, in this case, say, m by m, OK? So, so at this point, we basically finished the case of SO2. I showed you that we can solve problems, optimization problems of, 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 of the kind that we discussed over SO2 using semi-definite programming. Now, but now you can ask, okay, so what do you do for, uh, for, for general compact groups? I'm going to do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to take the delta function over the group. The delta function admits this representation because the Fourier coefficients of the delta function are simply the identity matrices. And so these are called the characters over the group. And, and now, again, we just shift. We shift it as, as we did before. We write it in terms of the xijk. And again, we get non-negative constraints. And that the trivial representation is, is 1. And again, we can play the same games of, of truncated. So for example, over, over SO3, Feyer already proved that if you take the second order Cesaro mean of, of the Dirichlet kernel, then it's non-negative over the group. And so we can use that to, to impose the constraint. Now, perhaps I should say that, that, that this, this trick of using the delta function, well, it, it, it really comes from a, from, from a semi-definite program that, that appears in the work of, uh, of Moses Charikar and, and the Makarichev brothers, where they, 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 they work in a finite uh, setting, and they, they try to, to, they come up with variables that are actually permutation matrices. But those permutation matrices, you relax them. And the way you relax them, you relax them into the set of bistochastic matrices. And bistochastic matrices are just matrices that have non-negative entries. And every row and every column sums to 1. So if, if you think about it, it's just a delta function. So the entries are non-negative. And, 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 but now instead of sum to 1, we have in, in, integration to 1 because we are of, of a possibly an infinite group. So compact. OK, so, so we have this SDP. And now we are interested in to, to understand how it performs in practice. So f for us, in practice means that 
how does it work on, 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 on our noisy data? And so what we see in practice is, is some remarkable phenomena that we call tightness of the SDP. So what I mean by tightness of the SDP, this means that we run the SDP, and, and so even though at certain places like, we did all kinds of uh, relaxations, like we dropped the rain constraint, or uh, we relaxed the fact that it should be delta by only positivity, non-negativity constraint, and, and, and integral to one, despite all these relaxations, we actually see the solution as exactly the desired rank. That is, it actually finds the, the solution to the non-convex problem. So, so whenever this is the case, we know that our semi-definite program actually solved the original non-convex problem. So if it was the maximum likelihood estimation problem, then we actually have a certificate that the SDP came up with the global solution to the maximum likelihood problem. Now this sets it apart from, from all the other methods that are currently using practice like expectation maximization or alternating minimization, where you know that you find that you convert to a local, to a local uh, optimizer, but you have no idea whatsoever if it's, if, if it's actually the global one. And here actually the SDP gives us a certificate whenever it finds the MLE. And numerically, we observe to, that up to some level of noise, it, with very high probability, it finds the, the, the global solution, the, the MLE. And then there is a phase transition, where above that, that level of noise, it, it fails to, to find it. Now, just a few final remarks related to the, to the cryo problem. So if you remember, I, I, I said that, that, that actually, using Cuomo lines, we cannot, we cannot uh, I mean, we cannot find the chirality or handedness of the molecule. So what it really means, that it means that actually there are two different solutions, two different sets of rotations. One is given by, say, G1 to Gn, and another one is given by conjugating the G1 to Gn by a matrix J, where J is simply a diagonal matrix that associates with reflection. Just a diagonal matrix with minus one, minus one, one on the diagonal. And so the SDP, can actually find one of the two solutions, or actually can find any linear combination of them, any convex combination of them. And so we can actually guide the SDP in finding just their average. And you see that when I'm taking the average of, 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 of these two, and you use the fact that we actually know what is the representation of J, well, this would just be a diagonal matrix of size 2k plus 1 by 2k plus 1, with k of the entries on the diagonal being one, and the other k plus one being minus one, or, or vice versa, based on the parity. And actually, it splits the representation of size 2k plus one into two matrices, one of size k and one of size k plus one. And that's actually, in addition, it reduces the, the computation that we need to do. And we actually exploit this, this j symmetry, and, or j uh, conjugation. And also, if you're dealing with, with, with with molecules with point group symmetry, such as, say, cyclic symmetry or dihedral symmetry, then, again, the size of the representations is smaller. Because, say, for example, if you deal with, uh, with molecules with cyclic symmetry, then say that you're looking at, say, linear polynomials, x, y, and z over the sphere, then out of the three, only one is invariant to the, to the group action, so only z is invariant to rotating the sphere, x and y change. And so this changes, this, this reduces the size from three to one. So similarly, you, you, you only need to consider invariant polynomials to the, to the action of the symmetry group, and this reduces the size of the representation. So symmetry helps as, as it should. And one last final remark is that you can actually even search for translations and rotations simultaneously. That is, the cryo-M images are not perfectly centered. And there may be a small shift in the, say, either left and right or up and down that you also need to find for the images if you want to get to high resolution. And so really the group that we need to deal with is not SO3, but actually the group of Euclidean region motions in R3. 
Now, the issue with this group is that it's non-compact, and it does not fit the framework that I described so far. But because that you know that, that, that the shifts are small, you can actually map this, this non-compact group to SO4. So in general, S, SED can be mapped to SOD plus 1. So for example, shift on the, on the real line, you can think of, of, of the real line as taking a very large circle. So like we are now on the, on, on the globe, well, we don't really realize that we're on the globe. We think that we are on the plane, right? So, so, so for all practical matters, you can take SC3 and embed it into SO4 and now use the representations of SO4 and do the entire procedure that I described so far. So, so I'd like to, to finish by just telling you the papers that, that, that correspond to the material that I showed today. The most relevant paper is, is, is the one that we just uh, posted on, on the archive uh, yesterday. And the work that I described today is, is, is uh, joint with uh, my, student, my students, uh, Afonso Bandera and, and, and Yuton Cheng, that are both here. And, and this was uh, influenced a lot by a previous work that, that we did also with uh, Moses Charikar. And, and I put on top some, the, the reference also to the original approach that, that used uh, for the least squares that, that for the common lines method. So with that, I would like to thank all of you.